uh, on Sunday night of con. It's nice to see so many people here. This is the uh, Limits of Skepticism question mark panel. And uh, uh, we're going to get started with introductions. I'm moderating the panel. My name is Matt Lowry. Uh, I'm a high school and college physics professor, and I blog at The Skeptical Teacher. So, shameless plug, check it out. And to my left. Hi, I'm Margaret Downey, and I'm the Frigatriscodecophobia Treatment Nurse, as well as the founder and president of the Free Thoughts Society. I also have a business called Secular Celebrations, and um, I run the Thomas Paine Pennsylvania Memorial Committee. I'm Dr. Pamela Gay, <clears throat> and apparently I'm losing my voice. Uh, I am an assistant research professor at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, where I work in the Center for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Research and Education and Outreach that does line wrap. Um, I, I am an astronomer, and I am director of the CosmoQuest uh, Virtual Research Center, which has a booth where all of you are encouraged to go learn and do science. I am DJ Grothy, president of the James Randi Educational Foundation, a national science education uh, nonprofit that focuses on advancing critical thinking, especially about claims uh, related to pseudoscience and the paranormal. Uh, Massimo Pellucci, uh, evolutionary biologist, philosopher, City University of New York, uh, blogging and podcasting at Rationally Speaking. My name is Debbie Goddard. I'm the Outreach Director at the Center for Inquiry, so I oversee the campus and community programs. I'm also the Director of African Americans for Humanism there, and I occasionally blog for Skeptic. Uh, and I'm Tim Farley. I'm a Research Fellow for the James Randi Educational Foundation, and I created a website called What's the Harm that you may have heard of, whatstheharm.net, and I blog at skeptools.com. Okay, so uh, just a a uh, note for the audience. Uh, we will take audience questions, but we're probably going to wait a little bit uh, later towards the end to do that. So if you have a question, please hold on to it, and then we'll l uh, let you queue up and uh, ask your question. Um, the, uh, the, the topic of the panel is uh, ostensibly uh, the question of uh, how far can skepticism go in terms of uh, looking at, say, claims of religion, existence of God, and so on and so forth. But we can also get into some other topics. But for now, let's just maybe start with that one. And I think maybe a good starting point on this would be to try to get into a definition of what is skepticism, because that kind of, that's going to kind of set the ground rules, I think, for the discussion. So anybody want to start off? I could just draw attention to the banner in the background. <laughs> Examining extraordinary claims <clears throat> and promoting science. So, uh, as Margaret pointed out, that definition, that's a definition that we use for scientific skepticism, and of course I agree with that. Uh, national uh, skeptic nonprofits use that definition because they're focused on something that over the last 30 years we've called scientific skepticism, uh, meaning we're focused on pseudoscience and the paranormal. But skepticism, of course, is broader than that. People can be skeptical about something the president says, or skeptical about this political system or that economic claim. And so uh, if we're defining skepticism as something the Skeptrack's talking about, we're talking about scientific skepticism. But as I've said for a number of years, I said in the uh, keynote at uh, the uh, Nexus event a few years ago, I favor personally skepticism that's widely and broadly applied. That said, organizationally, or if we're talking movement, uh, it, it does benefit us sometimes to uh, limit our scope uh, sort of as a division of labor. So as a quick example, American atheists, I'd consider them an organization that advances skepticism. They do some other things too, advances skepticism about the God claim. They're pushing atheism, right? And no one goes to American atheists and, sa and says to them, why aren't you pushing skepticism about ghosts or psychics or Bigfoot? Why? Because they're set up to... Uh, with their own educational mission. That limited mission, I think, benefits them because organizations, nonprofits, are good when they don't try to do everything for everyone. But personally speaking, skepticism is just doubting nonsense claims, unsupported claims, and uh, that can be widely applied. Yeah, I, I, I favor, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I'm suddenly reminded of when I heard Speaker Ravi Zacharias say he was once taking a um, entrance 
form for a theological uh, doctoral program, and he was given a space, yay big, to describe God. And he was quite glad that he was asked to be brief, because being brief meant that he had um, less opportunity to uh, confuse and stray into the land of lies. I think sometimes we just need a simple, brief definition. Yeah. Skepticism is looking at the world and demanding evidence and demanding a predictive nature to what you're discussing. Okay, Massimo. Uh, so I go back actually to, a, I, I also favor a broad definition of skepticism, and I go back to David Hume, um, who is, uh, was a, a Scottish philosopher 18th century, and, and uh, the guy that actually originated uh, the phrase that was later rendered by Carl Sagan as extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The way Hume put it was that a, a wise man or woman uh, proportioned his belief to, have, to the evidence. Uh, so skepticism in that sense is a positive attitude uh, that examines claims based either on evidence or on logical consistency. If we're talking about, for instance, religious claims or claims about the, you know, theolog theological claims, uh, then the evidence may not actually, there may not be any relevant factual evidence, but there may still be ways to get at those, at those claims in terms of logical consistency. So it's, it's using what is known sometimes as Hume's fork. Uh, you ask whether there is empirical evidence in favor of a claim, or if there is no empirical evidence, whether the claim is logically consistent. If it fails both uh, tests, then as Hume famously put it, you can consign it to the flames because it's bunk. Okay. Um, Tim or Debbie, do you have anything to add? No, that covered. Okay. <laughs> my, my definition is somewhere in there too. Okay. Well, well I always, I was just going to throw in, it's not nearly as robust as what uh, Massimo just said, but I always uh, talk, I always uh, pitch my, what I call my elevator pitch for skepticism, which is, you know, a simple way to explain it to someone in, in the course of an elevator ride. And I, I talk about, and it's based on some of the writings of Daniel Loxton, and I talk about the intersection between science education and consumer protection. Um, and obviously that doesn't cover everything, but uh, it covers a lot of what we do at the JREF. And, uh, you know, using science to figure out whether or not you're spending your money on bunk. Uh, spending your money or your time or your attention on bunk. Um, and, and that's a simple way to explain it. Uh, to people that, that gives it in positive terms that uh, I find useful. Well, my, my, I, will, I live in New York, so our elevators rides are <laughs> lo longer. <laughs> Good <have> point. More <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now that we've kind of gone through and gotten sort of a feel for what skepticism is, so the title of the track, uh, of, the, of the panel rather, is, uh, you know, limits of skepticism, question mark, right? So I think it maybe would behoove us to maybe discuss and perhaps argue a little bit whether or not there are limits of skepticism. Say, let's, let's, let's just jump right in and take the, take the big one head on, you know, the God question. Um, can you believe in God if, and still call yourself a skeptic, for example, or even if you do, uh, is that a claim that can be tested using skepticism, or is it beyond skepticism? Let's, let's get some thoughts. I think, again, we need to really draw a distinction about what we're talking about. Are we talking about scientific skepticism, this project that the organizations are focused on, right, where you look at testable claims, or are we talking about, you know, just uh, sort of waiting to assent to a proposition until you get good evidence or good reasons, in which case, of course, you could be skeptical of God's existence. Most skeptics, many skeptics that I know, are atheists. Um, but not all. Exactly, but not all. Uh, famously, uh, Martin Gardner was a fideist, and he's sort of the grandfather of organized skepticism. Uh, our friend Pamela Gay, of course, is a theist. Um, and so if you're talking scientific skepticism, of, of course, then you can believe in God and be a good skeptic. Um, but the opposite end of that, and we get it at the JREF all the time, some atheist activists say, doggone it, you scientific skeptics are somehow telling us we're not allowed to be skeptical of God. And ain't no skeptic I know ever saying that. What scienti some scientific skeptics are saying is, let's... For our project over here, we're going to focus on these testable claims that we could investigate, but no one's going around hectoring atheists to say that they're not allowed to be skeptical or going around to believers and saying, get kicked out of my club because 
you believe uh, something theological while we're dealing with these testable claims over here. Um, I think that's why we have to draw a distinction between this project of scientific skepticism and just sort of being skeptical in general. The, the word skeptical sometimes feels like the word theory. It's something that has different meaning for different individuals. Mm -hmm. As a scientist, when I refer to the theory of gravity, I'm referring to something that I know is completely true. At the same time, when I say, well, in theory, there's an elevator that I can get that will get me up to my room. <laughs> same word, two radically different meetings. And when we use the word skeptical, there's people who say that they're climate change skeptics. Well, those are people that are denying the evidence that exists for climate change. And, and so we need to be careful in what, what we discuss. If you start from the question, can you prove or disprove God the same way you can prove or disprove the theory of gravity? The answer is no. Right. Gravity is something that is based on evidence that can be done over and over and over in labs. Gravity makes, the theory of gravity makes predictions about what will occur if I do something like dropping this lid. I can predict how fast it's going to fall and the uh, energy it's going to impart to the table and even how loud the noise it makes is likely to be. That is an evidence-based theory that has predictive capabilities. God isn't something that I can predict anything about. In general, yeah. I mean, there are theistic claims that you can test, but you're saying your theism is... I, I, I would say that the average biblical Christian, Jewish, or Muslim view on God is one that doesn't make predictions that can be tested on known timescales. All right, I'm going to draw the distinction slightly differently, if, if you don't mind. So um, I, I tend to agree with, with DJ that there are, there's a distinction there between what certain kinds of religious claims can in fact be tested, and, and then there's other aspects about religious claims that cannot. <coughs> For instance, if a creationist tells me that the Earth is 6,000 years old, that claim is false, period, on empirical yes. grounds. Okay? We can go and check the geological record, we can look at physics, at chemistry, and at biology, and we know that that claim is, to the best of our knowledge, uh, false. So, th and if, that, if you take that as a religious claim, because it's based on a particular interpretation of a particular script, a kind of scripture, then clearly you can falsify, in, in, in just from the point of view of scientific skepticism, you can falsify that claim. However, I tend to get very nervous when people talk about you know, the God hypothesis, and they treat the concept of God as a scientific hypothesis it can be tested. Of course, Richard Dawkins being one of the examples of doing so. I think that is simply nonsense, because God is such a vacuous concept that it cannot possibly be treated as a scientific hypothesis. A scientific hypothesis has to be specific. There has to be something that I can sink my teeth in, and has to make predictions that are empirically verifiable. God is Wait. infinite number of things to, to different people. Uh, they think of it in different ways. If you ask them what, their, what the attributes of, a God, of the God is, they will differ uh, different in, their, in their opinions. So there is no theory. There is no coherent view of what a God is or is not. And that's even if you stay within the Judeo-Christian uh, Islamic tradition. If you go outside of that, you know, all bets are off. There's all sorts of stuff out there that, that people think of as God. So in that sense... Um, the God hypothesis, quote unquote, it's not falsifiable, it's not within the realms of scientific skepticism, but I don't see that as a limitation of skepticism, I see that as a limitation of the concept of God. It's just yeah. that people can't tell me what the hell it is, and therefore I can't do anything about it. Yeah, th this is a brilliant point. This, this is, any, any of you who've listened to astronomy cast for any amount of time know I hate string theory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. Um, and, and Tell the, us how you really feel, <laughs> Pamela. <laughs> well, so, so the reason I hate it is it's a lot of mathematics that don't make any predictions that are separate from predictions made by much simpler theories of supersymmetry and basic pot particle physics. And it has a lot of... Pop particle physics? 
<laughs> I don't think I did. Okay. No, <laughs> um, so when, when you're looking at string theory, you have all of these ideas, and, and Brian Greene is brilliant at communicating all of these ideas, and there is not a single iota of, of uh, testable, predictive nature to all of this discussion he's putting forward. So, so everything that's getting out there, it might describe reality, but there's no way that I can test it or use it to predict anything about reality. And someone who says, I believe in string theory, is making a statement that is no more or less true than someone who says, I believe in God. And it's that same separation between being able to be predictive and being able to explain reality in a way that is unique. So I think what we're really getting down here, I mean, beyond Massimo's point about the, the question of, you know, well, okay, well, how does one define God and so on? It sounds to me what we're really getting down to is the whole idea of the, the process of scientific skepticism being based upon methodological naturalism and, 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 and so on. And, I, I, and when somebody was discussing a few moments ago about the idea of, well, I think DJ, it was you. You were saying, you know, that you that JRF sometimes catches flack for. Well, you know, how can you believe in God and still be a good skeptic and so on and so forth? Um, I think that well, maybe, we sort of get it from both sides. Yeah, you get it, yeah, you get it, you get it from both sides, and I and I think that there needs to be a clear distinction made between and it's a plug for you, Massimo. The the distinction between methodological naturalism and philosophical naturalism. Yeah, yeah, it, it's but it's the not the is, same thing necessarily. Right. The, the problem is you get in trouble at that point because then people have even within the skeptic community very different ideas about philosophical naturalism. So, for instance, I think the philosophical naturalism, which for all effective purposes amounts of, to be an, an atheist, um, is a perfectly reasonable position. In fact, is the most reasonable position by far. Uh, for the simple reason that it is consistent with everything we know about the universe, and there is no reason, in my opinion, or evidence to think that there is anything outside of nationalism. Therefore, any supernaturalist position, I find it non-reasonable in the human sense of, you know, I don't think any, there, is, there is no positive reason to believe it. Um, but we need to be clear that we, ju we just left science and we are into philosophy at, that, yeah, at this we, point. You left scientific skepticism. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It, I mean, I'm not point. claiming that on empirical grounds. Yeah. I'm claiming that on logical grounds, on or, or on you know coherence grounds, or whatever you want to call it, but not on empirical grounds because I just said there's no way to empirically test that. It, it's the point at which you start making choices, and you have to say this is a choice I made, and the choice you make, I can't use scientific imperialism to say that it's any more or less valid than mine. I simply had to make my own choice here. Yeah, uh, that's right. From a scientific perspective, yes. From a philosophical <coughs> perspective, I think we can still have a discussion. Yes. Um, yeah. But scientifically, you're right. Best held with alcohol at 4 a.m. <laughs> so many things are. Or Sunday night at the con. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, are there any other final comments from any of the panelists or anything on this particular question? Because I do, I do have some other ideas to where we can direct the panel, but anybody have anything that they would like to add or? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, based on some of the stuff that DJ was talking about, about what the skeptics movement, or sorry, what skepticism does, and then what that means. And some of that is what the skeptics <coughs> movement does and what skeptics groups do. When people come together and they make a group and that group has a purpose, and some of that might be, let's address certain kinds of claims, certain kinds of questions, and then let's go out drinking afterwards because that's what skeptics do all the time too, right? <laughs> and some of this is uh, when you have an organization and an organization has a specific mission, how can you best advance that mission? Who do you need to be able to work with? You know, what kinds of questions are you addressing at conferences? Uh, who do you invite to be speakers and whatever it is? And people do have different ideas about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. When it comes to religion, that has historically fall a lot of religious claims like, you know, is there a God and should we all be atheists or not, have not been the biggest part of what the skeptics movement, if you talk about organizations, has mm -hmm. focused on and spends their money and time on because they have a different kind of mission. But when you talk about what skepticism is <laughs> and what skepticism does and what skeptics do, not necessarily in the bounds of what a skeptics group does, of course 
we address questions like this. Of course, we're evaluating kinds of claims of you know, what we think the Bible says, whether or not we believe, whether or not our friends believe in all of this. So in that sense, it's not outside of the bounds of skepticism. Yeah, I, uh, Debbie, I really love that distinction. So to make it as complex as, as it really is, you just had a sort of uh, breakdown of, well, there are national organizations, then there are local clubs and groups and pub gatherings and whatever. There's something called a movement. Maybe we use the word movement. You know, the national organizations aren't peddling uh, skepticism about every sort of claim. They have missions that they have to fulfill. But you go to a skeptics pub gathering, you'll hear people debating, you know, I'm a social democrat versus I'm a libertarian, and no one says, you're not allowed to talk about that because we're skeptics, and that's outside of the scope. Um, they might talk about whether, you know, 10 years ago I remember questions about whether there were weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East, but that wasn't something that we were talking about in our skeptics group meetings. That was, you know, after we went to lunch yeah. afterwards, people were having a hearty discussion about it. Exactly. And so that distinction, I think, zeroes in on the fact that there are national educational organizations with limited missions, and then there's something we call the skeptic movement, a sort of identity politics of skepticism, where people join something and they say, where have you guys been all my life? I finally found my tribe. These are my people. I was all alone before, and now I found people who are the same besieged cognitive minority that I always thought I was, right? And we all get together, and at a movement level or a grassroots level, um, really no questions are off limits, no issues are taboo, people love to debate, we all just get together and thrash it out, and that's sort of the fun of it. Um, but if Matt's asking um, about the scope of skepticism or the limits of skepticism in terms of the educational project that educational organizations are involved in, there emphatically is a sort of uh, uh, scope uh, uh, question there. I, I think it's important to note that the skeptics movement is a group of humans. As humans, they are deeply flawed and broken. This is true with any organization you go to. And like any group of humans, there is the main meeting that you attend where the topics are policed and the discourse is civil, <coughs> more or less. And then you go to the bar afterwards for what I've heard some organizations refer to as the slander and gossip session. <laughs> and this is the point where it sometimes th seems that no holds are barred and the discourse becomes uncivil. And, and the question I'd have each of you ask is, is it right that an organization that starts with the idea of let's have a civil discourse on living an evidence-based reality should then go forth and drink heavily and act in an uncivilized manner where we let our inner demons out? Well, I don't know. I mean, I go to plenty of New York City skeptics yeah, it's not drinking dangerous. thing, and it's, I never saw that that side actually it was it's almost it's always jovial and, uh, and 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 those are groups that are more civilized after hours I suppose um, uh, yeah I never thought about ourselves as particularly civilized but 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 I mean I don't I don't <laughs> <laughs> but also not vicious. no what I'm saying yeah that's right exactly I've never seen the viciousness I suppose I think one of, one of the things that we may not be addressing or maybe maybe we just went around um, uh, the, uh, the crucial question is that um, in Having, having for, for several years served on skeptic and humanist and atheist organizations, I noticed that, you know, it's, it's obvious, we know, there is tension among uh, people who tend to consider themselves more skeptics than atheists, and then there is the secular humanists. Let's leave that, those aside for a, for a moment. Uh, I think that the reason, you know, for, the, for that tension is pretty obvious. That is, uh, skeptics think of themselves as dealing with empirical claims. And atheists think of themselves as denying what essentially is a philosophical uh, claim or, or a claim of, of faith, depending on how you want to look at it. And there is a distinction there. Mm -hmm. huh. The trouble is that there is also a lot of overlap. So I don't know the exact numbers, but you know, I think you're right that a majority, not all, but a majority of skeptics def definitely are atheists. And a majority of atheists are skeptics. Not all. Right. Mm -hmm. I do know atheists who you know, indulge in uh, 
alternative medicine quackery thing or whatever, quackery or and all that sort of stuff. Right. Landing yeah. denialism. Correct. That's right. Or even climate change denialism yeah. for that matter. Yeah, exactly. So, so there, but there is a large overlap. So the tension is precisely, is there precisely because there is a large overlap between these two communities and yet the core uh, uh, sort of philosophical positions of these communities are in fact different. Mm. That's what's going on. And, and my best guess is that the tension isn't only because of those differences, but also because of a, uh, an investment each subculture in this subculture, you know, the atheists or the humanists or the skeptics, that the investment that each smaller group has in that agenda. So you might hear a skeptic say, uh, my gosh, those atheists, what a waste of time, you know, fighting over in God we trust on the dollar bill or whatever. And you'll hear atheists say, gosh, you skeptics, who cares about Bigfoot? There are bigger battles to fight, you know. Uh, keep not bigger God off, feet, but not bigger, bigger, feet. Yeah, not bigger right. feet. Yeah, <laughs> keep, keep God off our money. And you'll hear humanists say, no, what we really need to do is advance a secular ethical morality, right? And so from my perch, from my vantage uh, in, in these organizations, I was at Center for Inquiry for 10, 11 years. Now I, I'm about to begin my fifth year as president of, of the JREF. From my perch, I say, look, the solution to that, maybe it's a little simplistic, is just to let people have their own priorities, right? Like, I wouldn't want to join uh, HRC, Human Rights Campaign, National GLBT Advocacy Organization, and say, why aren't you focused on climate change, right? Or I don't want to join PETA and say, what, you don't care about gun rights? Why aren't you advancing that? So in other words, let folks have their own priorities and push as much as you can your own agenda. And uh, you know, that's, how, that's how we advance our ideals. Yeah. Well, I think PETA is actively against guns. Yeah, <laughs> uh, good, that's probably a good guess. Yeah. Fewer guns, fewer animals get killed, exactly. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Well, like you that. know, in the world of atheism, um, I'm considered a soft atheist because uh, I, we purposely chose the word free thought and free thinker because we wanted to be welcoming to those who are questioning and don't want to be labeled with an ism. Uh, we don't. Um, we, we seem to appeal to those who have taken baby steps towards atheism, um, <coughs> but they're not real comfortable with the word, or you know, don't understand what is a humanist, or you know, what is humanism. So the word free thinker, I think, has been very advantageous to to the 501c3 educational organization that I founded in 1991. But there is a need for people to find kinship in isms uh, and to, to find uh, an investment of their time to expose themselves to others that are like-minded. So, you know, it's not up to me to say that I'm right or that, you know, the atheists are right or that the humanists are right or the skeptics are right. I think that we are appealing to a broad level of the public and we need to keep going. And it's the public that will dictate to us what their comfort level is. One of the things that, that I think sometimes stands out to me because I, I am like the one scientist who's outed themselves as a Christian among those who do the popular speaking tour is every site I go to there's at least one person who comes up and goes thank you for admitting to be a Christian I'm also a Christian but I just listened to all of this atheism around me in the skeptics movement and I'm afraid to say anything and one of the things that concerns me is we do know that there are many Christians that leave the science classroom and science majors at the university because they're tired of feeling like they're being harassed by their faculty. I had this happen in graduate school. There were two of us that were admitted publicly to being Christian. We had a couple of the professors saying, well, clearly you're never going to be a good scientist and just going after us during tea time. And they eventually put the two of us in one office together so that when the other grad students started harassing us, we could close the door. This was socially acceptable. 
most people, when they experience this, they leave the program. And my office mate did leave the program before he got his PhD. Mm -hmm. And when the skeptics <coughs> movement says publicly, we're built on scientific imperialism, and then privately speaks a message of hate towards people who are believers in something, they leave or they become closeted. And that's harmful to us having the consumer product change, to making sure people get vaccinated, to creating a better culture for everybody. We do live in a country where there's more people who believe currently in some sort of a greater power than don't believe. And don't we want all of those people to think scientifically? That's, a, that's, that's an excellent point. Um, I, I wanted to kind of uh, pick up on that point because we, we had actually, in an earlier panel, uh, Mosmo and I were, were, were on, we actually kind of touched on this with the creationism panel earlier today. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's worth piggybacking on your, on, your, on your comments because when you are getting into questions of religion and, and, and these, these particular points, you're, you're, you're really driving at something that goes very deep at an emotional level mm -hmm. to how people identify themselves mm -hmm. uh, and how they see themselves in the, the, the world. And, uh, and I, I have certainly discovered over the years that when I have those discussions that I need to be mindful of, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it's like here, you know, know your audience, right? Be mindful of who you're talking to. And now that doesn't mean you don't ever challenge them, right? It doesn't mean that you don't have that discussion about the existence of God. It doesn't mean that you don't do that, but how do you have this discussion? What's the tone of the discussion? I think those things are very important. Well, I had a, a talk last night with someone during a happy hour, and um, he you know, was very um, open with me. And uh, I said, did you go to the parade? He said, yeah, I watched the parade. And, and I said, well, did you see the educated monkey? Um, that was in the skeptic, track, uh, the skeptic section of the parade. He goes, oh, the educated monkey, yeah, I hate those skeptics. <laughs> They're worse than the God believers, the Jesus freaks. Wow. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, we didn't want to convey this elitist, uh, you know, or, or this, uh, this type of batting someone over the head with, with skepticism because what we were promoting was education and knowledge. And he compared the skeptics to um, Jesus freaks. Uh, and I was quite taken aback by that, but defended our position <laughs> and invited him to come tonight. Is Ken there? <laughs> so so Ken? This, is, this is where you, you have to recognize most Christians aren't Jesus freaks, <laughs> and most skeptics aren't assholes. Right. <laughs> and well, I, depends on how much drinking I've been doing, I don't know, honestly. You know. But, but in both movements... I want to see the data. <laughs> <laughs> in, the night is young. In both movements, you do have the loud and cruel individuals. Yeah, yeah but, but the question that I think we're tiptoeing a little bit around is how do you engage uh, somebody with, a, let's say, a religious belief in a way that is respectful, yes, but still is an engagement, right? Because yeah. we don't want to, we certainly don't, I hope, we don't want to get to the point in which you say, no, the religion is off limit in terms of discussion, right? right. Because enough, in theory at least, for a um, sort of skeptic in the sense that, that we were talking about earlier, nothing is off, the, off limits. There is no, nothing that is in principle off limit to reasonable discussions. So the question is, is how do you have a constructive or at least respectful discussion with somebody um, acknowledging that that person has a belief that you may actually think it's irrational. I, I think it's completely valid to start from the perspective of why do you choose to have the belief system you have? And work through the, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Have you considered this archaeological, this, that, or the other thing? What do you think about... Uh, I mean, there's, there's so many things that can be studied from a scientific point of view. The, the Shroud of Turin is, is 
an amusing, bogus thing. Um, most of the shards of the original cross have been falsified. Occasionally you find real bones of saints and that's kind of nasty. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes down to why does someone believe in something, it, the question is why and you listen and you listen respectfully and we can have disagree disagreements of opinion and as long as we realize this is the philosophical land where people come to conclusions for different sets of reasons and, and we try to understand one another's sets of reasons, we may not agree with the sets that have been chosen but it should be a discussion that can be had civilly. Um, I, wanted to, I, wanted to, I want to give Tim a chance because he hasn't spoken yet. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things I talk to skeptics a lot about is specializing and focusing on something and not try to cover the whole mm. realm of it. And one of the reasons that we came up with the concept of talking about consumer protection and scientific and, and <coughs> science education was just trying to bring up, you know, there's a lot of kind of frothy, you know, silly topics in skepticism like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster or whatever. And it's like, well, why don't we use that as an example? And what I found in experience is inevitably you think you found your perfect example that no one believes in and then you run into a believer, right? So you say, oh, well, we're skeptics, like, for example, and then you happen to pick the one thing that that person actually believes in. Mm -hmm. And... If you extend that same problem to the religious problem, if you're trying to teach someone to critically think about the evidence for vaccines, but you've come charging into the room saying, I'm an atheist, you're going to turn off a lot of religious people right out of the chute, and you're not going to have a chance to talk about what a double-blind study is and what scientific evidence is and stuff like that. So you have to think about how your words are going to be and how your presentation is going to be taken by people um, and, and I just choose to work on kind of the science end of it and not go all the way up to the God question. It's almost like you're playing a video game, and it seems to me the atheists always want to go to the boss level <laughs> and fight the boss, That's fine. right? That's really I, I'd, rather, I'd rather go through all the mazes. I want to find all the little secret rooms and stuff. <laughs> That's a that's a hell of a good analogy. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. That's a, somebody tweet that. That's good. Yeah. It's out on the internet right Tim, now. Tim, I think you hit it on on the head there. And you know, when we're talking about tone, and that's what we're talking about now, how to effectively communicate your skepticism. In fact, I draw no distinction between communicating one's skepticism, maybe not scientific skepticism, of God and communicating one's skepticism about vaccines. You, you might turn off a lot of theists if you run into the room uh, where people are talking about vaccines and you say you're an atheist, but you'll also turn a bunch of them off if you run in and say they're dumb if they deny vaccines, right? So right. the tone matters regardless what the topic is. Um, moreover, Matt seemed to say the big kahuna, the big issue about talking about religion is that it's a really cherished, deeply held conviction. But there are all sorts of stuff scientific skeptics make it their business to worry about that are also deeply held beliefs and cherished convictions. If you go to someone who believes in psychics and you start critically examining those claims, they will respond just like the fundamentalist Christian if you say there ain't no evidence for your God because those are also deeply held beliefs. That's why tone matters regardless of where you are on the scope. But we should also make a distinction, I think, um, when we use the, you know, you made the point earlier that you can use the word theory in very different, um, mean, with different meanings. You can also use the word reason in very different meaning. For instance, um, you know, I've heard here, you know, what is the reason people believe X or Y? Well, are you asking about the epistemic reasons? That is, you know, the kind of reasons you can actually explain, you know, sort of a logical, uh, on logical grounds or empirical grounds, or are you talking about psychological reasons? Mm -hmm. That's a completely different kind yeah. of reasons. And, you know, there's not much I can do about a psychological reason other than take, uh, take note that it exists and talk to a person uh, in a nice manner because I want to be a nice human being, period. So, so understanding that 
no matter what that person believes, uh, there, are, there, there are going to be psychological reasons why he believes or she believes that, and those, uh, there's nothing I can do about it from an epistemic perspective. I can still engage the person epistemically while respecting the psychological part. I don't need to go and psychoanalyze that person uh, in order to have a conversation. And those psychology of belief reasons don't mean any of those things they're believing in for psychological reasons are off limits. Uh, Correct. At TAM, now, so you sort of just described uh, that some skeptics might just, you know, they be, they're nice on the main program and then go in the bar and everybody's vicious or sort of mean, especially to God believers maybe. Um, that hasn't been my experience, but maybe I'm biased at the wazoo. Um, we do survey data for, uh, for attendees at our big event in Vegas every year, over a thousand people, well over a thousand people show up, and only three out of four people who come to that event say they're atheist or non-theist. Uh, that doesn't mean 25% are Christian, but there's something else. They're you know, maybe religious humanist or deist or fideist or maybe some Christian, etc. cetera. Okay. And those folks hang out with the skeptics not as something other than a skeptic, they think they're skeptics too, right? And they engage, and uh, as we always say, you know, it's, it's not that believers aren't allowed, right? Uh, believers in, even if you're a ghost believer or a UFO believer or something, come on, let's engage, let's talk that out. Um, but don't hang out with the skeptics. Don't make it your business to hang out with the skeptics and say, but you can't bring up this one a uh, special belief I have because if you do, I'll be offended, right? So, personal example, I'm really into something called transhumanism, sort of a techno-optimism, believing in this great vision of the future, applying technology to radical life extension, et cetera, et cetera. So I offended you earlier. Massimo <laughs> believes I'm full of it on that, right? So that's, that's one of my little pet things that skeptics say, oh, okay, you're permitted one, but only one, <laughs> right? So if I bring that up at a cocktail party or a mixer or a pub gathering or whatever, I bring it up wanting to engage on it, talk about it, etc. Now, if I never bring it up, but someone knows that I'm that, and they like, they're doggedly, tenaciously mean to me, ridiculing me or whatever, I don't want to be in that club. But that's not describing the club I'm talking about. That's my point. I um, I, uh, go on, Debbie. Oh, I, I didn't know if you want to move on to the next question, but some of this, all right, I think about a lot of this in terms of group organizing, because the way that I got into this movement was through local groups, and campus groups and then helping to organize groups and so I learned a lot about leadership and I learned a lot about why people join groups and the different <coughs> kinds of groups that there are and why people come back or don't want to come back and a lot of what we're talking about is what it takes to make a safe and welcoming movement mm -hmm. what it takes what makes people want to hang out with each other what they talk about how they interact why some people don't feel welcome in those environments why sometimes we're mean how that might not help us accomplish our goals mm -hmm. and so two quick things one I changed high schools halfway through, grew up in Philadelphia, at some point moved to the Burbs when I was 16, started a high school in the Burbs. I was one of very few students of color there. My guidance counselor made me join the Black Students Union, and <laughs> uh, you know there were very few black students in the school, and the first meeting I went to at the beginning of the year, they were, they were pretty anti-white. Um, it was just this kind of like sigh of relief, like, oh my God, finally you guys, oh, this, these white people just don't understand, right? I know, they're like, can I touch your hair? Can I touch, I just tell all these stories that like, you're like, oh, I know, right? I can't tell any one of my friends about this because I never get to, and so there's the first thing you do when you make a group, generally the easiest way to define a group is to Shared identity. talk about what the out group is and how you're not that. <laughs> Especially like a besieged upon minority, and skeptics do that, and we're like, oh man, those believers, or oh man, that's what a, you know, they're such bad thinkers, they're so stupid. Oh, we're so good that we, we figured it all out, we know how to be good thinkers about something. <laughs> and I've seen that in so many groups I joined, that was kind of the first where I was like, um, the, you know, that's 98% of the people at the school are, are these people we're talking about. But I get it, this is our place to kind of go and sigh and be like, ah, now I can be this part of myself, that's an important part of my identity. Uh, second thing, I was talking with Brian Brushwood last night, the uh, skeptic, and he's been on uh, some things for this, and he's a magician, and he's funny, and I remember finding out that he was a libertarian, and in the there circles I run with often, That's you know, you find out that. someone's libertarian, and people are like, 
Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I didn't know that. I don't know if I can hang out with him. And <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And so, like, the, when I first learned, I was like, really? <laughs> oh, well, he's Texan, so that's probably why. Uh. <laughs> oh. It's true. <laughs> oh. But, uh, yeah, so they're booing me. Um, <laughs> But I remember looking up online, because I was like, really, is he? And I googled Brian Brushwood Libertarian, and there are a couple things online. Uh, and I found that he got in a, he had a long discussion that was recorded. I think there might be two one-hour segments with this liberal activist guy, uh, Baratunde Thurston, African-American, just about kind of libertarian values and perspectives versus these very liberal democratic, Democrat ones. Um, and I asked Brian about it last night, and I was like, yeah, I haven't listened to it yet, but I just bookmarked it. And he's like, no, it was really great, because even though we were coming from such different perspectives, and we had different experiences that informed our perspectives, it was completely like civil and open, and when he said something, and even though in some circumstances it might be like, Psh, that's bullshit, I was like, really, tell me more, tell me why you think that way. Like, you know, I never, I thought about this other thing. Did you ever take that into consideration? He said it was so open and so good and we both learned so much about each other. You know, we still ended in the same basic political position we were in before, but it was much more informed, it was much fuller. You know, we might shift, we realized that and we wouldn't have had that opportunity mm -hmm. if we had just come at it as people who were trying to be enemies about something. You know, so, that, that's, that's really that's interesting awesome. because it seems that what we're what what we're what a lot of what we're talking about here is when, when we talk about you know the, the 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 topics that we deal with as skeptics you know when we label ourselves with that ism right um, it, it seems that you can extend a lot of the I guess wisdom that we're that we're, we're discussing here into other realms I mean you, you like you just made a good political example um, and. And, and you can extend that into other things. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it's almost cultural in a sense, it seems to me. Um, and it, like everything, right, you know, skepticism does not live within a bubble. We, we, are, we are products of our culture. We're products of our environment and upbringing and everything. Um, so, you know, when, when, when we discussed earlier about how you know, there are some people who are into the Bigfoot thing. And there are some people who want to, you know, talk about the existence of God. And then there are other people who, you know, that they're about UFOs uh, and, and all of this stuff. You know, there, there's also people who try to apply skepticism to more cultural issues as well, such as uh, gay care. and lesbian rights, right. politics, uh, issues of feminism and so on and so forth. And, and, and I think we're starting to see a real branching out in that respect. Um, but if we think that we have, part of what our movement uh, tries to reinforce is the tools of good thinking. Yeah. And we meet other people and they're part of this, they've been involved for years, they're all, they've also been honing these good thinking tools. Mm. And then we find that we come out at such different ends on something like, you know, libertarian versus progressive, yeah. we're just like, you must be doing it wrong, yeah. right? It, it, it's <laughs> as if they become, it's as if they it become a bigger right. enemy than the cultural competitors we're all actually riled up against. Right. And that's right? the same with religious yeah. beliefs, and that's the same with other things. In some cases, I do think you know we're doing it wrong. And, and, but how and do we change people? How do we change ideas or, or understand? And and this is where the after hours conversations, the tone becomes so important because while I have at times had someone at Tam basically go on the, how can you possibly be a Christian? You're a horrible scientist. I, I've gotten that a couple of times, but it's not a big deal. I mean, you move on with life. Having boobs grabbed is a much bigger deal. Um, both need fixed. Um, but the issue is you're the person sitting there checking your email on your phone. There's people talking to you behind, and they're going off on the Christians. They're going off on the gay marriage. They're going off on the uh, extension of um, unemployment tax. They're going off on, and they're doing it in a anyone who believes this is an asshole way. Mm. And it's hearing that all around you. It's going to a forum and, say, and seeing things like, let's go rape skeptics. 
Um, oh my God. All this sort of hate exists within every community, including this community. And I have to ask, why can't we be better if one of the main goals of this community is to work on consumer protection, to work on medical protection, to extend scientific thinking? We are trying to generate a better world, so why can't we be the better example? Mm. So to rejoin, just two, two points on that. Uh, I think it's important for us as organizers and people invested in growing this movement. I'm not talking about organizations now. I'm talking about people who mm -hmm. sort of engage in this identity politics of skeptics. I'm a skeptic. You're a skeptic. We're part of this movement. Those folks, I think it's important that we don't conflate really horrible things online. Like, I would not like to, I can't fathom that anyone in this room would ever say they want to go rape someone. Right? Except but, back, no. Okay. But Ooh, I can't okay. imagine some anonymous Yahoo online says really horrible things and sort of plugs in online cultures again anonymously. If anyone is not anonymous, like if they're a movement skeptic that we all know and they act like that, I, I can confidently say, come on, they don't belong here. That, that's a reason. Uh, you know, to ostracize or reject, right? Uh, not if you believe in God, or even if you're a global warming denialist, or you're a libertarian, or a social democrat, or a Marxist. But uh, you mentioned that other example. I mean, that's a big distinction for me. That's not like, well, to each his own, and we could have our different opinions on that, right? Uh, second point, when we're talking about you know, we're talking about it and not knowing or not meaning to talk about it, or at least not naming it, but we're talking about diversity right now in the skeptics movement. And uh, diversity comes in, it's diverse, meaning it's not just one kind of diversity. So one thing I prize about this movement is that it's ideological, uh, ideologically diverse, it's politically diverse, it's culturally diverse, it's sexually diverse, it's... Uh, you know, I'm a gay guy, that's a certain kind of diversity. No, and is. a certain kind, yeah. Except everybody's sort of joining the club these days, I'm gonna join a new one. Um, <laughs> so I bring that up because it's too easy for us when we found our tribe and we thought, we thought hey, these are my people, uh, to expect that everyone believes just like me. And uh, you know, so about a quarter of the people who uh, come to our events might call themselves libertarian or right of center on some economic issues. And I'm the first to say, I might disagree with them on some things or the Marxists on other things, but scientific skepticism, it, scientific skepticism ain't going to solve the big question of is it Keynes or is it Hayek who's right about the commanding heights of the economy, right? Scientific skepticism can tell us a lot about ghosts or testable paranormal claims or pseudoscientific claims. And those other diverse ideological differences, I think we just have to sort of be grown-ups and realize ain't not everybody going to believe just like me. And I, you know, I hear us actually sort of agreeing on, on that. Okay, I'm going to disagree slightly. Oh, okay. Because yeah. I, I think awesome. this, is, this is becoming a little too much of a touchy-feely, everybody's welcome place. Um, <laughs> I mean, except right, except the rapists. Yeah, yes, God. of course. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you, yeah. you, you qualified yeah. that. Yes. The bouncer. No, so, so wait a minute. Um, I think there is a distinction to be made there between engaging people in a constructive and respectful fashion, which I think you should do with anybody, yeah. regardless of how far uh, that person is from your ideological, uh, lifestyle, political, et cetera, et cetera, religious position, regardless. But <clears throat> this is, in fact, a movement, or in fact, I think it's better described as a, as a number of movements that partly overlap, as we were saying earlier. Uh, but it is a movement. So within that movement, yes, there is heterogeneity, and that heterogeneity needs to be uh, uh, you know, acknowledged and cultured. I mean, we want more diversity of the kind that you were talking about, but up to a certain point. For instance, no, I wouldn't want a bunch of UFO nuts in, in the skeptic movement, simply because they are not about what we are about. Yeah. We want to engage them, for sure. We want to engage them respect, respectfully, but no, I, you know, I wouldn't want a UFO uh, you know, conspiracy theorist as a president of uh, JREF. Yeah. That, that'll be the time I stop, stop going to TAM. Right, so, but why not? 
right? Well, that's because we are a group. We're not society at large. So we want to be as inclusive as possible, but even that inclusion has actually, in fact, sure. limits. Otherwise, you lose your identity. Every group gets to define the broad brush strokes of right. its identity. You're not going to be a warmonger and join the Quakers, right? Exactly. Uh, but that said, uh, skeptics might come hand in hand together around certain projects, and someone might believe in UFOs, but really have some expertise, say, on some other skeptical topic and be able to yeah, contribute true. to that project. So I agree with you, except for what I just said. Uh, okay. So a, a, another quick example. Let's the biggest uh, 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 piss and vinegar fight, I think, uh, these days, although there are a lot of them online, is the denialists. There are, there are folks within the skeptics movement with uh, a, minor, a very small minority of folks with a loud voice who are, because they're libertarians, they're very skeptical of statist solutions to human-caused global warming. So they deny that it exists because of the implications of accepting it exists means we're going to have to have big government coming in and they don't like big government. So some of those folks are in this community. Right. And I don't want to kick them out because they do some great stuff over here for scientific skepticism. Right. I don't want to have sort of a doctrine of non-beliefs for the skeptic. So even if someone believes in UFOs, but is doing good stuff over here or is open to engaging, like I don't want to be doctrinaire, your, your broader point remains though, look, as a community, we get to define the broader brushstrokes of our identity. Right. So. But, We'll, we'll, we'll hold, hold for any comments or questions in a few moments. I do want to ask Dr. Gay um, if she feels that comfortable here and, and part of the tribe, um, because she's sitting next to a pretty outspoken atheist, um, but I have never engaged you in that conversation. And so, so how I feel in this room, in, in general, the audience at DragonCon has always been accepting of me. And for that, I'm very grateful. Um, I'm someone amused to be the token Christian up here. <laughs> um, someone had to do it. Um, in the skeptics movement in general, the shark, sharp awakening I had was there was one time on my blog that I, I forget in what context I brought up this story, but I brought up when I was a graduate student, I had two of my students come to me extraordinarily upset because one of their professors had written on their exam the question, and it was phrased this way, how do you believe the universe will end? Full stop, write a mini essay, 20 points on the exam. And these were both Southern Baptists. They both discussed Armageddon. They both got zero on the question. Mm. And, and I told them, look, there's nothing I can do about this. You should have understood he was asking you to describe whether or not you thought it would be a collapse, an asymptotic going to nothingness or just expanding forever. But what you wrote was valid for how the question was written and he shouldn't have phrased it this way. Everyone was wrong in this situation. May, may I ask you what class was this? It was, it was in an astronomy class, but the question was still phrased, how do you believe? Mm. Yeah. Oh. yeah. And there was no, within the context of the class, information given. So it asked the student to make a belief <laughs> description and did not provide constraints. Well, I disagree, I guess. In that case, the constraint is characterized, is, is provided by the class. I mean, if I ask a, a question... But you're dealing with teenagers. Teenagers are going to do dumb shit. And this is one of those things... <laughs> and they're going to pay the consequences for the dumb shit. And, and, this is where, and this is where my answer was, everyone screwed up. And we as faculty, if we're trying to test our students' understanding of the concepts, need to not set them up. I wasn't specific enough in writing my blog, and I got attacked by PZ Myers. Oh boy. As happens. Yeah. <laughs> now, fine, whatever, PZ can be a dick. It gets his readers up. He gets lots of money this way. It pays to be a dick. Um, there, what, what do they say? Two ways to rise to the, crop, uh, the top, right? Be the cream or be the scum, right? Now, so, so, so the problem is 
that when blogs like his attack somebody, there are followers. And for about three months, with a far too long half-life, every Monday, my inbox was filled with initially hundreds and hundreds of hate letters. And it slowly decreased so that it's now like one every three or four months. And it was finding out that there are letter writing campaigns of hate against Christians within the skeptics movement that made me just sort of back out. Wow, I stopped. That is such news to me. And, and I've talked to others, and I know this has happened to other people. And this is one of the reasons that I sometimes say we need to learn to be the better example. Because writing to people, and it, it was nasty stuff written with hate and vitriol, all because I was a Christian. Mm. And what the fuck, life is too short. Go do science instead of hate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those nasty skeptics should just know something about skeptic history. And you realize there are a lot of great contributing skeptics who weren't party line atheists, I think. So we need to do a better job of that communication. If you're, if you're getting hundreds of pieces of hate mail my, from something I think of as the skeptic community, my God, that is news to me and it's shocking. To me. It's shocking. There's lots of us in the community who for ver various different reasons, whether it be our gender or a belief system, get hate mail. Wow. Yeah, but you don't actually need, I mean, that's true, uh, but you don't actually need to be either a Christian or a woman to get that kind of mail. I yeah. mean, I've had the same source directed, not at me, but at one of my friends and colleagues who is, in fact, a man, and he's an atheist, mm -hmm. and he happened to write something that uh, the person you mentioned uh, vehemently disagreed with, and he got hate and mail got as a it. result. Yeah. Uh, and I've gotten hate mail not because of the person you mentioned, but uh, I've gotten hate mail, you know, about me being gay, right? Early on in my time at the J. I thought everybody was on board uh, with that. I know. Well, I'm working on it. Okay. So, uh, you know, people said, oh my God, now it's the gay ref, it's not the J. ref, those oh. sorts of things, right? Ooh, that's a good one. one. <laughs> now, it, it is now pretty good. Cool. Yeah, I could have written it myself. But, but it, right. is, it is catchy. I mean, yeah, that's clever. Awesome. I mean, yeah. The Center for Inquiry. So, yeah. Where's George Takei when yeah, you need right. him? Yeah. We've got right. Dr. Right. Pamela Gay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, wow. But, but the point is, I guess maybe we're saying sadly that there's enough hate to go around. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. But the question I think is, um, you know, so when we talk, we, we need to be careful about uh, when we talk about the skeptic community, because we don't actually know how representative these people are of yeah. the community. I mean, th True. this is not denying the problem. There is yeah. a problem. The question is, I... You know, we don't have studies, we don't have surveys, we don't have, you know, uh, uh, other than anecdotal evidence. Uh, and so we don't know if it is a very vocal, very nasty minority, or if, in fact, it is a pervasive issue. Or and if they're even part of this. Maybe they're just in right. a basement somewhere correct. in their mom's That's house, correct, you know. because that's the thing that, as you pointed out earlier, that's the problem with, you know, internet, um, you know, commenting and all that sort of stuff. I mean, some uh, time ago, I had to move my blog to moderation for the comments because I was getting hate mail, I was getting death threats, blah, 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 the usual yeah. stuff. And so I went to moderation. Can and I just point out, he just said I was getting death threats and all the, the usual, usual stuff. stuff. Yeah, all the usual stuff, right. <laughs> yeah, because that's crazy internet culture. Don't read the bottom half of the internet. Correct. Now, as soon as, but as soon as I did that, it was like, it's, it sort of felt like a miracle because as soon as I did that, of course, the whole thing stopped, clearly, because there was no outlet. But it's not that the number of comments stopped. It's that all of a sudden, the quality of the comments got much, much better. Uh, the traffic on the site is still about the same size, if not larger, but the quality got better, from which I d have to infer that actually there were a lot of people out there that simply were turned off from some of the comments and didn't bother to comment on, on, on the blog. So I actually raised the, the, the quality of the, of the discourse by simply going to moderation. Now the question that I have, and I don't have an answer to it, is you know, so were those people you know, a vocal minority? Were they not even part actually of the movement? They were just you know, crazy loony out there who liked those, doing these kind of things? Or in fact, are they a significant portion of, you know, yes, roles, or, in, uh, or are they a significant portion of the community? I don't know, and I think that's actually a crucial question that would be worth investigating, because, you know, it's one thing if we have a systemic problem, 
It is another thing entirely if we have a uh, minority that can be isolated and dealt with. Yeah, you know, if it's systemic, it's different. Yeah, yeah. Some, something that you just said, uh, Massimo, uh, reminded me of, uh, of, I heard something really, really good uh, from uh, Eugenie Scott. Uh, she's the I'm not she, surprised. She was the former director of the National <laughs> Center for woman. Science Education. Yes, absolutely wonderful, wonderful woman. And she 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 wrapped everything that Massimo said up into this one pithy phrase. She says the solution to uh, bad or hurtful or harmful speech is not to ban it. She said the solution is to have more better speech. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that is an excellent an excellent point to to conclude on. Um, and we, we, we've gone over our hour, but I mean, we still have some time before we need to vacate the room. Uh, so if there are any audience questions, uh, I think we have a, uh, I think we have a, oh, we're, we're out of time? Oh, we have two minutes? Okay. Two minutes. Okay, we, we got a couple minutes. So if anybody's got a question. quick question, you can line up right here at the, uh, and okay. please make sure that you are asking a question because we, uh, we are very limited on time. Yes, ma'am, go. Uh, okay, so actually I have a a quick comment and then a question. The first comment is that it turns out the director for the National Institutes of Health, Francis Collins, is a Christian too, so Dr. Gay, you don't have to feel alone. Secondly, and he's very open about it, he has a couple of But books. don't ever ask him if he's cosplaying when he's in his military uniform with the name badge Admiral Khan. <laughs> Just don't. The second, the se- my question is, um, when I think of skepticism, I think of a way of thinking, uh, skepticism in this context. Um, it's a way of thinking kind of like how scientists are trained. We are trained to analyze a problem, think critically. And, and um, I think that it's, it's not just like a, it's not really a belief system so much as a way that we go about analyzing a problem or a situation. Um, and while we're talking about, you know, being diverse and being inclusive, um, I feel like we're a very self-selecting group. Like, I feel like everyone in this room pretty much agrees with everything you guys are saying. So how do you go about um, spreading, spreading the word, so spreading the good news of like, you know, thinking like a skeptic, right? So it's actually a way that you train yourself. And how do you not necessarily change someone's beliefs, but change how they go about thinking about something? Uh, t- two quick things. Skepticism is for everybody. It's not just for smart cookies. It's not just for people who engage in the Mensa effect, right? Thinking we're smart and we could have this dialogue. It's for everybody. Uh, Socioeconomically disadvantaged people, why is it for them? Some of the biggest culprits who prey on them, who beguile them with harmful nonsense, uh, beguile them because they can't be or aren't yet skeptical. We can provide a service for them. I'm thinking of the audiences of, say, Peter Popoff. He advertises this faith healer on black entertainment television. Supernatural debt relief. Well, that's a, can I call it a target market, right? Those folks benefit from the intellectual karate or the intellectual self-defense that skepticism is. It's not just uh, for us to get together and argue about another nonsense belief we don't believe in. Uh, I'd like to also mention uh, something in addressing this question. I, what I'd like to say is, I think that part of part of spreading quote the good word of skepticism, as I like to call it, is you have to be patient and you have to be willing to engage in these discussions with people who aren't necessarily skeptics, and you have to be willing to do this for a very long time. You have to understand that when you have conversations about certain topics, because in many cases, these topics are so near and dear to people's hearts because it forms a core part of their identity, such as, say, creationism. You, you, you can't expect to win them over in one or two conversations. Uh, you have to have these discussions with people for years. You have to be patient. And though there are times you want to, you know, knock them over the head, you, you have to kind of bite that back. Uh, that's that's my advice. However, uh, I if th- I may, I'm sorry. No, Go ahead. Well, well um, I'm thinking about this in the context of some very racist things I've seen in skepticism in online communities particularly, and sometimes you can't sit and be patient about it because if you try to immerse yourself in an environment with so much uh, hatred that's directed at something that's very important to your personal identity, you won't last that long. You will be out of the movement. Um, So some people have to be patient and argue allies and the people being attacked. Um, That is 
th those are things that lead to change. Uh, sometimes it's organizational principles. Sometimes it's you know operating. Um, sometimes it's it's recruiting your friends, and sometimes it's recognizing, I guess, what you can and can't spend your time on. Or, or as or as was said in an earlier panel on this point, you know, there are some people you'd be patient with and compassionate with, and then there, you know, in reference some to Phil plates, don't be a dick. There are some people that just need to be dicked. And you can also help us in 2014 and be in the parade and convey skepticism through a fun way with costuming. So see me later. Um, Okay, I have a um, slightly different answer. Um, final which comment is, from which is not, Which is not mutually exclusive with what the other uh, answers have been proposed, but in, I, I think that there is pretty good empirical evidence uh, worldwide that the best predictor of increasing critical thinking in the population is simply public education. Yeah. And I'm not even talking just about science education, although that's important, just education period in general across the board. Uh, that is the single most important statistical predictor of the ability of a population to, to think critically across the board. So if there is one thing you really want to support is public education. And if there is one thing that has really gone down the drain in this country over the last 20, 30 years is, in fact, public education. Um, and it has gone down the drain because of a concerted attack from the, from the right. This is not a chance. It does not happen by chance. It's happened by design, yes. unintelligent design, I would say, but... <laughs> you're, you're totally going to get libertarian hate mail now. Well, oh, there, there, there. No. sure, okay. I'll take it. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think Matthew would agree with me if I said, can we end this by everyone going, science! Science! science. Okay. Philosophy! <laughs> Philosophy and science!